Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Grow Your Occupancy podcast. I'm Julie Podowitz, CEO and founder. If you would like to learn a little bit more about what we do at Grow Your Occupancy, you can find us at growyouroccupancy.com. And if you enjoy the podcast, I'm told to tell you to like, subscribe, and review five stars because it, it helps others find us who might also be interested in our content. And today, the content is going to be amazing. I have a panel of very talented, very skilled senior living sales specialists with me today, and they're going to share with you all what they do that yields success and some common gaps that they see as they work in your databases. So if we could kind of go around here and just do a quick introduction. This is a, a few of the GROW team. Really proud to Donna. Want to start with you? Uh, my name is Donna Monteleone. I've um, been a sales director for several years, and then I did some sales consulting. And of course, now um, the virtual sales um, specialist role. Um, and I've also trained other sales directors in the region. Awesome, Donna. I think Dresden, you're next. Okay, my name is Dresden Sincerac, and I'm the Vice President of Training and Internal Growth for Grow Your Occupancy. I have about 20 years in the industry, ranging from the front desk all the way to executive director and above the community in support roles regionally and divisionally. Awesome. Who's next? Lori. My name is Lori Vernier. I am a virtual sales specialist for Grow. I've been in sales and marketing for 20 years, very passionate about the sales process. And I have most recently been a regional director of sales and marketing in the senior living space. All right, Melinda. I'm Melinda Haney. I am Grow Your Occupancy's Vice President of Operations. And I have the pleasure of working with all of these wonderful um, virtual sales associates because I also do a lot of virtual sales, uh, especially with our clients. And I have been in senior living for over 20 years in the Florida market. I also do have done anything from uh, admissions and skilled nursing to assisted living, memory care, independent living, and um, on communities as well as uh, regional Roles. You do a lot of life care too. Yes. yes yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dawn. Hi, I'm Dawn Holt. I have been with the Grow team now almost uh, two and a half months. So wow. twenty, yeah, twenty years in healthcare. I have worked private practices, skilled nursing, and recently was a regional over uh, five communities before joining this amazing team. There's a lot of talent here, and Dresden. I'm going to start with you. Since you head up the team of more than a dozen virtual sales specialists, what does a virtual sales specialist do? Our virtual sales specialists sit in the seat virtually as a sales specialist, like one would normally operate in a retirement community. Our sales specialists sit for a specific period of time. They are very highly productive. It's almost like a power hour where they sit and do nothing but scrub a database in support of an existing sales team. Or if there is a gap in a sales director in the community, we sit in and we schedule tours. We make phone calls. We dig for change in the couch. Sometimes we pull out a penny. Other times we pull out $5. It's somewhere in between, but highly pro productive. And we are focused on getting folks in the door and uh, increasing move-ins. When I look at reports, and as we record this, it's the beginning of the month. So looking at the prior month, and the, in this one case, it was six months trailing month over month. And to look at the, the initial three months, and then that first month, that the virtual sales specialist supported the community and month five and month six, the difference is astounding. Of course, like you said, you are, you all have, you sit in the seat when there's a gap or when there is need for a special project or added support. 
and you have the opportunity. And now we've been in hundreds of databases. We know everybody's busy and we know it's always more, the job is more than what one person can really do. However, people listening, because you guys get such great, great results, might want to know what do you all do, but I'm going to start with gaps. So solving the occupancy puzzle, identifying areas of opportunity to improve result. Dawn, I'm going to start with you. What, what is one common gap in, in the database or, or what you're seeing maybe a sales director could tighten up? Sure. The biggest thing I am witnessing and with a lot of this and even coming out of being a regional, I would see it constantly, is there's no call cadence. So the, you know, a sales rep might make the call today, might decide I'm going to call that one again next week. We need to establish a set call cadence to make sure these calls are being done on a schedule, being, you know, completed, followed up. Um, but that call cadence is going to be the most dynamic thing um, in developing, I think, warming up cold leads, helping with your new leads, and um, just being above and doing one thing above and beyond what your competitor is doing. Okay, so uh, is anyone else seeing that? Lori, what about you? I agree with what Dawn said, and um, something that goes hand in hand with that is when they do reach the lead, and if they are in the research mode and not ready to tour right at that moment, what are they doing to nurture that lead? Are they just dismissing the lead and then going on looking for another hot lead? Or what are we doing during that time to nurture the lead? Because I, I, I see that gap um, and that could be a great opportunity for us to stay engaged until they are ready to tour. So, Dresden? Perhaps this is one area of, of really, of a passion of mine is that Letting your leads go past due is a broken promise. So if you're setting those really solid next steps with regard to follow-up and you set your next step before you end the conversation, perhaps they're not ready, they're just researching. But if you say, I'll give you a call on X date at X time, then follow through with that because leads often will leave. They will go somewhere else. They will go where people appreciate them or where they feel appreciated. So look at past dues as broken promises. The longer you kick out those dates and the longer that you ignore the red, the more broken promises, the, the harder it is to fix the crack in the plate, so mm -hmm. to speak. Mm -hmm. Well, I jotted that down and I always take notes. These are great. I want to get back to all of them, but a, a letting leads go past due is a broken promise. It's pretty profound. Mm -hmm. Donna, what do you think? Yeah, I agree exactly. Um, well, I agree with what everyone has said. And, um, you know, just the follow-up is what I'm seeing a, a, a large gap in. Um, if whether they do set a clear next step or oftentimes they don't set a clear next step, um, but there is a lack of follow up. Sometimes I see that a, a follow up call has been set six, eight, 12 months after the last call. Um, and, you know, as a young sales specialist, I, I remember taking a person at their word. And if they said, oh, we're just looking, we're not going to be doing anything for a year. And I set them six months out and then I would call back. Guess what? they'd already moved somewhere. Um, you know, so again, like Lori said, you know, um, you've got to nurture the lead, you've got to set the cadence um, and keep those promises. Because I know even as a consumer myself, if someone makes a commitment to me and they don't keep it, that is a show of their lack of or of their excellence. Hey, Melinda, you often get the fun job of digging into an established lead base, mm -hmm. often for life care, but you have certainly leaned in on the, the rental mm -hmm. side. Can you give us, and you get tremendous results, tremendous results. Uh, tell us what you do. What's a day in the life of a virtual sales specialist digging into that established lead base or what people could refer to cold leads? I don't like that word. Mm -hmm. I do think the call cadence does come into to a play. One, I think it does make our lives easier 
because you're not always at the end of a call deciding what the next step is. So let's make our lives a little easier. Know what your call cadence is. I also make sure I'm not calling the same day or the same time so that you're trying to reach people at different times, at different times of the day, different days of the week. Um, you might just be reaching, you're trying them on the same day they work still, because I, I am in independent living a lot. Um, so that's something that I might be looking at. Or maybe if you are in a system, maybe you're trying to get people's families, right? So that's very important. Um, I do find that sometimes we're relying only on telephones, and maybe we need to text. Maybe we need to really, really try email text. I do a lot of leave messages and then send an email that says, I have left you a message today. And that layering of trying to reach out, I will start to get um, more responses. Okay. Um, so more, um, so we've used a word I want to ask, maybe I'll bounce it back to Dresden, call cadence. For those that might not know exactly what you're talking about. Can you give an example? And then I definitely want to get back to layering because you said you're getting great results from that. And Dresden, you had your hand raised. Yes. <laughs> Important not to interrupt. The call cadence typically to be the most effective needs to be very specific okay. and followed as a regimen. It becomes part of who you are. And the call cadence, not only like Melinda said, you know, layering in your points of contact is extremely important, but the consistency is also important and varying. So for example, our growth sales specialists, they follow a very specific sales cadence. Day one through day five is picking up the phone, leaving a message and really notating that and where you fit in or where that is in the cadence is important because it's an immediate, oh, got it, I'm on day two. So be, as we be grow more familiar with the lead cadence, we know exactly what we're going to do to reach out to this lead. So it might look like day one, day three, day five, we're calling and leaving a message, but we're also text messaging and we're also sending an email. Mm -hmm. Nine times out of 10, I would say 90% of our sales specialists when then within that first week are getting that lead on the phone when they first raise their hand. And it is because of polite persistence. And when you layer in these additional, these additional forms of contact, like text messaging and emails, then what happens is they know, well, this person is actually trying to get a hold of me. Perhaps I should reach it back out to them because it doesn't sound like they're going to stop. But we often hear, thank you so much for your persistence and getting in front of, you know, getting in touch with me because of the fact that it's been a really crazy week. My mom has fallen. We've been in the middle of the hospital. We don't know what's going on. Just like our phones could be going off right now and saying, Hey, I'm right in the middle of something. I'll get to that later, later comes. And then we realize at 9 PM when we're trying to go to sleep, Oh gosh, I forgot to call that person back. So that consistent follow-up with someone, especially when they first raise their hand for senior living is really, really critical. I also think the layering gives people the options of their preference of how to reach us. And in an older database, as well as a, a first new inquiry, but an older database, um, when we're going in new, we don't know. And a new director of sales in a community, you may not know what their preference is. So you're reaching out in all different ways, giving them the opportunity to reach you. And what Melinda says um, just reminds me, something that I run into a lot is a lack of notes of clear discovery in the database. So when you're following up with someone, you might see completed call on this date, but you have no idea um, what was said, what was done. I often see scheduled tour, but then I don't see any notes on the tour. So I'm left with wondering, do I call and ask them, you know, key tour follow-up questions? Um, and sometimes they've said, well, I didn't make it in, you know, so that, that clear information in the system is critical. 
I would also venture to say that is if you're a new sales director just coming in and you're going blindly into a new database, it's the same way we coach our VSS is that treat everyone. If they've never gotten on the phone with somebody and that lead is a year old, go ahead and reinitiate a new tour or new lead cadence so that you can try to get them on the phone and make that connection because we never know where, where they are. We never want to assume, and we certainly don't want to jump to solve, oh, this was a year old. So they're probably, they've probably gone somewhere. Let's try to get them on the phone, connect and be a resource. I do think we underestimate these leads that have been in the database for six plus months. And I find frequently that those are the leads that maybe have been researching for quite some time and are now ready to get serious. Uh, I do find that often. So what Dresden just said, as far as never, ever assume and pick up that phone and go that make those extra calls because it's usually the one that you think, oh, this probably isn't going to connect. Those are the ones that answer and you connect with that might be more ready for that conversion. So I'm taking notes, notes, notes. This is a lot of great, very specific information, tips, gaps. So it sounds to me like to recap a call cadence, meaning a scheduled, a scheduled call. And you used the term, oh gosh, Dresden, you use a term discipline, polite persistence. polite persistence. I love that. Be polite persistence. But you said that that cadence, that schedule is you really need to be disciplined with it, establishing a schedule, right? And being polite, keeping in mind, not following up is a broken promise. They reached out to you either yesterday or two years ago, which reminds me, and I know you all have stories like this, and those of you listening have stories like this, but Melinda, you specifically reached out to a woman in a database who was in there for over almost two years with zero, zero contact, a couple of email attempts, maybe one or two voicemail. And you, she said, I was waiting for someone to call me. And to your point, Lori, I like that you said we often underestimate the prospects that have reached out to us a month ago, a year ago, six months ago, two years ago. For all of those people who say, I'm not ready right now, they may or may not be ready right now. We don't know, but that's often what we hear because what, what that means, right, is don't push me, you know, don't push me. But for those that aren't ready right now, and they, and they inquired six months ago, wouldn't they be the hottest? Could prospect be. Mm -hmm. yeah could be yeah so lack of notes any any uh one else any else anyone else see or experience lack of notes yeah i think the biggest thing i would try to educate not only myself but when i was leading other sales directors set that next person up to not fail at this. I mean, get the information in there that they need. I don't need to know that you left a message. What did you state on that message? What was the point when you did connect with this person? It wasn't just, I had a conversation with Mary today. It went well, we're gonna follow up. We need that discovery. So like I said, God forbid one of us gets hit by a truck, but you want to make sure that you're leaving behind, you know, it's a little piece of yourself. You're, you're putting the effort in, you made that connection, you have your next steps, you have created this story for that next person to walk in and say, oh, this is great. I know everything about this lead. I'm going to take the call and go from here. Don't make us dig. When we're sitting here searching through things, it's on, you know, a lot of times we're getting paid hourly through these communities and we're having to dig to find out any little bit of information because somebody didn't do that 30 seconds of, of effort and that's all it takes. And I think that's even true for your own follow-up. I mean, if we are making, in some instances, 15 calls in an hour, that's a lot of people to try and remember that detail on. So if it's in there for yourself, top line, and you can look at, see what happened last, um, then you're ready to go. And even that call cadence, as Dresden said, if you put what day it is or what your planned next step is, you don't have to do as much reviewing because you're set up for success right there. 
Absolutely, Donna. Having that those notes for your follow-up is critical as well, because otherwise we're going to spend additional time and not be as productive by reading, 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 reading versus this is what we talked about high level. This is what we talked about. And this is what I'm going to talk about this time. We're setting ourselves up for really, really good productivity and we're setting ourselves up for success. They're not having to retell their story over and over and over again. That's why it's really great to start with a high gain question. How's your search progressing? Something very, very simple so that we can get down to, we can get down to the basics immediately and move the sale forward. So, so, so much content and feedback. Thank you all. If you are eager to hear more, there will be a part two. And I would like to thank you all again for joining. And for those of you listening, you will hear more from this amazing, amazing Grow Your Occupancy Sales Specialist team. If you'd like to learn more about Grow, again, growyouroccupancy.com. Thank you all very much for joining me today. And I look forward to connecting you with all of you and during part two.